Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you this morning for being so kind, for being loving, and patient, and forbearing. Lord, we are awestruck that the creator of all things and the sustainer of all life would see to even call us friends. And more so, you desire us to be your sons and your daughters. Thank you, Lord, for looking upon us, looking upon us and considering our worth in Christ. Thank you. We also thank you, Father, for the great gift of not just your Son, but of the Holy Spirit. And we ask that the Holy Spirit would have sway in our life and our experience even now. That we might be led into the truth. That the conviction of the word would be uh, such that only the Holy Spirit can bring. Tabernacle with us at this time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, and happy Sabbath to everyone. <clears throat> it's always a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. What do you say? There's a slight change. Uh, in your bulletin, there is, uh, you already know there's a scripture change. Uh, the sermon is changed also. Um, you know, you, you prepare throughout the week, and um, as I was going through my preparations, I was like, man, you know, things were just coming, like, really fast, right? Abnormally fast. And uh, this morning, just going over it again, woke up early, going over things, and realized, wait a minute, I have done this before. So I went back, and I started looking through my, my ministry journal just to see, and I was like, okay, I have preached this before. Uh, you know, now we're getting back into the parables. That was the desire. And um, I had realized that the parable that I was going to touch on, I had made part already of the series. So I said, well, I don't want to be redundant. I don't want to record it uh, a second time in the series. So I said, well, Lord, what do we do? And uh, the Lord had me settle on uh, what we like to call old gold in these parts uh, in the book of Isaiah. So that's where we're going to be studying together this morning. The book of Isaiah, chapter 6. So not necessarily a parable, um, but it will be a one-off sermon. We'll jump back into the parables next time. So let's go to our Bibles, to the book of Isaiah, the sixth chapter. Isaiah the sixth chapter, and uh, we're looking in verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. When you're with me this morning, let me know by an amen. amen. Isaiah what chapter? Verse 1. The Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. We'll pause there. Isaiah obviously had an experience. In Isaiah chapter 6, he sees this great vision of the Lord, high and lifted up, 
The Bible talks about his glory filling the temple. And when Isaiah sees this, the Bible says it caused such an experience in him where he cries out saying, woe is me. What was it about the vision of Isaiah 6 that called Isaiah to call forth such a strong denunciation against himself? After all, here is the prophet of God, the prophet to Judah. Here's the prophet of God who God had called, and yet he pronounces a woe upon himself. What was it about this glorious vision? And so we're going to take this particular story, try to unpack it a little bit, and then we will end on Isaiah's experience because Isaiah is what we call a pattern or representative man. In the spirit of prophecy, Sister White often writes about the prophets and the patriarchs and how they are representative men. In other words, they represent the people not only that they're ministering to, but they represent the people of God as a whole. And so here is Isaiah calling a, a denunciation upon himself such as, woe is me, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips, because Isaiah represented the people. We're going to see that the experience that Isaiah had is the experience we must have if we're going to be saved at last. And there is a key here. God lays out before us how we can have this experience. We, too, must see the vision. And so the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, how does it start in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 6? It says, in the year that who dies? King Uzziah. Now, King Uzziah is not really a, a, a very a famous king to most. When you ask people who King Uzziah was, it's, you know, very few may have even heard of King Uzziah, grandfather of Ahaz, which is one that we know more about, King Ahaz. But uh, let's, look about, let's look at the story of King Uzziah and find out what happened to King Uzziah. Why does Isaiah emphasize that when King Uzziah dies, I see this experience or I see this vision. Well, what led King Uzziah to his death? Was it old age? Let's see what the Bible has to say. The Bible tells us in the book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 26. 2 Chronicles, what chapter are we going to? 26. We're looking at King Uzziah. We need to have a little bit of background of this man. The Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, we're going to be looking together starting in verse 1, 2 Chronicles 26, and we're looking together in verse 1. Now, we're not going to read through the uh, entire chapter, so I want to read maybe the first, I don't know, five or six verses, then we're going to jump down a little bit, but give you a background of who this man was in the eyes of God. The Bible says, then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was how old? Sixteen years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. And he built Eloth and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his father. After that, the king slept with his fathers. Sixteen years old was Uzziah when he began to reign. And he reigned fifty and two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jecoliah. Of Jerusalem. And he did that which was what? Right in the sight of the Lord. How often do you read that about the kings? The Bible says he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Oftentimes you hear the opposite. But the Bible says he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah did. And he sought the Lord, he sought God in the days of Zechariah who had understanding in the visions of, of, the, of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to what? Prosper. So here you have this, this glorious beginning of this very infamous king. Bible says he does that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Bible said as long as he sought the Lord God, God made him to prosper. 
And then when you read verse 6 and onward, it talks about all his exploits, all the things that he did. As a matter of fact, when you read in the spirit of prophecy, you do a little bit of historical research. This man brought Israel, or, or Judah rather, to prominence before the nations. Uh, the only other king that did greater was Solomon. But here yet, how many of us have heard of Uzziah? And so very few. But next to Solomon, he was the most prominent in prospering the people of God. But notice what happens in his story. Very, very interesting here. In the end of verse 15, it says that he was marvelously helped till he was strong. And then there's a change in verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was what? lifted up to his destruction. The Bible says when he was strong, what happened? His heart was lifted up to his destruction. You know, it's very interesting when you go in the history of the people of God, uh, uh, when Moses was writing to them in the book of Deuteronomy and he's explaining to them all that God is going to do for them, how he's going to prosper them. He talks about how their heart would one day wax fat and they would kick against him, and they would turn away from the Lord. Something about prosperity does something to people. Not everybody can handle prosperity. The Bible says here that Uzziah was, was marvelously helped. I love that word or that phrase. He was marvelously helped until he was strong, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Now, in the Bible, we have various places where the uplifted heart is, is emphasized. Uh, uh, Daniel chapter 5, for an example, and I just want to make sure I give you the correct verse. Daniel chapter 5, you don't have to turn there, but Daniel 5 in the story of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, uh, in, verse, in verse 20 of Daniel chapter 5, it talks about how Nebuchadnezzar's heart was lifted up and his mind became hardened in pride. In the Bible, when someone's heart is lifted up, when somebody's heart is exalted, it's a symbol or denunciation of pride. And so when Uzziah became prosperous, the Bible says pride was his downfall. Now, it's very interesting because pride is what caused the downfall in the very beginning. You remember, matter of fact, in, in Ezekiel, go there with me, Ezekiel 28, and let's read about Lucifer and what the Bible says happened to him. In the book of, Lu in, in the book of Ezekiel, excuse me, not the book of Lucifer, the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel, I hope you don't have that book in your Bible, the book of Ezekiel, notice what the Bible says in chapter 28, Ezekiel chapter 28, about this lifted up heart where pride was birthed in the experience of Lucifer. The Bible says in Ezekiel 28, we'll look together, let's just jump into verse 17 for the sake of time. Ezekiel 28, verse 17, God says, thine heart, speaking to Lucifer, thine heart was what? Lifted up because of thy beauty, thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And so the Bible shows that Lucifer, the one who sealed up the psalm, the one who was perfect in beauty, was perfect in the days that he was created till iniquity was found in him. This individual is where pride birthed from. And the Bible says his heart was lifted up. This was his problem. Now, it's very interesting in the story of Lucifer, when his heart was lifted up, it caused him to want to do a few different things. And the Bible explains to us what the uplifted heart causes one to want to do. As a matter of fact, if you look in the book of, of, the book of Isaiah, look at the book of Isaiah. You know, you know these chapters, you know the verses, Isaiah 14. Let's go there, Isaiah chapter 14. Look what pride led Lucifer to do or to desire to do. The very reason he was cast out of heaven 
is found here. The book of Isaiah, chapter 14. We're going to begin in verse, uh, verse 12 and read to verse 14. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. Bible says, are we all there? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine what? Heart. Remember that heart that was lifted up? That symbol of pride? Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Let's pause for a minute. What was Lucifer's position? We didn't read about it in Ezekiel 28, but we, we, we know. What was Lucifer's position in heaven? He was covering cherub. I mean, if, if we were to, you know, go, go and say, well, you have God the Father and then Christ the Son. If we were to do it that way, I, I don't believe it in, in that fashion, but if we were to do it in that way, where does Lucifer fall on the totem pole? Right up under Christ. So when the Bible says, I'm going to exalt myself, I'm going to ascend in heaven, there's only so much further you can go in heaven. So what was Lucifer's problem? Who did he have a controversy with? Christ. When he says, I'm going to ascend into heaven, I'm going to take Christ's place. He says, I'm going to exalt my throne above the stars of God. When we think about a throne, what type of, what type of uh, individual sits on a throne? A king? What type, of, what type of power does a king sway? Church or state? State. Now we know Lucifer, he was the covering cherub, he was the light bearer in heaven, he was uh, uh, next to Christ, the leader of angels. And so he's like, listen, I want my power, my civil power, if I can use that phrase, to ascend. I'm going to exalt my throne. Then it says, look at, verse, look at what it says in, in verse 13. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also. Now, uh, 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 before we identify that part, when he says I'm going to ascend or exalt my throne above the stars of God, that's him. What are the stars of God? Angels. Who is the one that is ruling the angels? Who is the czar of all angels? The archangel, Michael. So this is him saying, I want to be in Michael's place. This is why the great controversy is not between us and Satan. It's between Christ and Satan. The Bible says, I'm going to exalt my throne above the angels of God. I want to be Michael, the archangel. And I will sit, what is that word? Also, what does that mean? In addition to, he says, I will sit also upon the mount or mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And again, that word or the name Michael means he who is like the Most High or he who is like God. So again, it emphasizes who he's fighting against here. But he says, I'm going to exalt my throne, civil power. And in addition to this, I'm also going to sit upon the mountain of the congregation. Now, what language is that when we think of congregation? That's worship or church language. So I'm going to exalt myself, my civil power, and at the same time, in addition to this, I'm going to sit also upon the mountain of the congregation. I'm going to lead Mount Zion on the sides of the north. So what was Lucifer trying to do? He's trying to bring together church and state. This is what pride was birthing in heaven. This was why there was that battle in heaven, that war, that polemic, that clash of ideas. This is why Lucifer had to be cast out. Because if he was not cast out, the very epitome of church and state that we see in Bible prophecy, which would be spiritual Babylon, he would have set up there. 
What Satan is doing here, it was always his desire to do there. And so he was cast to the earth. Pride leads church and state to join together. This is why, you know, the Bible, all these different thoughts come to mind. Daniel chapter 7, where the little horn, the Bible describes how the little horn was more stout than his fellows. Remember Jezrin? We were studying this last night. He was more stout than his fellows. That word stout is self-exaltation. He wanted to exalt himself. This is the principle that was in the heart of Lucifer. This great mystery of iniquity is centered in pride. The Bible says it led him to want to join church and state together. What does this have to do with Uzziah? Go to 2 Chronicles 26 again. Keep your finger there maybe because we'll go back and forth into this story. But the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 26, we'll look at verse 16 again. 2 Chronicles 26, Uzziah was strong until this certain day took place. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 26, 16, amen when you're with me. But when he, Uzziah, was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Why? It says, for he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord. Notice the Bible identifies that this uplifted heart of Uzziah led him to do the same thing that Lucifer did. Now you say, well, how was he bringing church and state together? What was Uzziah? He was king. What did he go into the sanctuary to do? To burn incense. Whose role was it to burn incense? The priests. So Uzziah was saying, listen, I'm going to be priest king. I'm going to take upon myself the prerogatives that fall to God alone. There is only one king priest in the Bible. And that is who? Melchizedek, Christ, or the symbol of Christ, the representative of Christ. I'm going to be king priest. And so here he is bringing church and state together, trying to be like God. The Bible says, going on in verse 19, Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up where? In his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him and behold, he was leprous in his forehead and they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hastened also to go out because the Lord had done what? Smitten him. Now the Bible says the Lord smote him with leprosy. We can see that clear in the text. So the question I'm going to ask you might seem a little odd. But how was it that he receives this leprosy in his forehead? What was the causative event? Now we know he goes into the sanctuary to do the work of the priest. We know he's bringing together church and state. We know his heart is uplifted. But what caused the leprosy? I want to look at something with you about King Uzziah. The Bible mentions there's there's two texts in the scripture that, that just kind of go off, just kind of mention something and move away. But when we put them together and then you go into some history, it 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 is it is telling. So let's start in the book of Amos. Go to Amos with me. Where are we going? Amos. I want you to go to Amos, the first chapter. It's the first chapter, first verse. Amos 1.1. Bible says Uzziah, like Lucifer, pride got in his way, 
skewed his vision, led him to want to exalt his position to that of God himself. I'm going to step in and take the place of Melchizedek. I'm going to be priest king. I'm going to bring two things together that God alone has power over. The Bible says in the book of Amos, Amos chapter 1 verse 1, it says the words of Amos who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of who? Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before when? The earthquake. So Amos is having this vision in the days of Uzziah and the days of Jeroboam. And the Bible says he has this vision, you know, two years before the earthquake. Very interesting. I want you to uh, go with me to uh, Zechariah. Go with me in the Bible to the book of, of Zechariah. Notice what it says. Zechariah. And we're going to chapter 14. Zechariah 14. And let's just jump down into verse 5. So Amos has this vision, days of Uzziah, days of Jeroboam, two years before the earthquake. Then the Bible says in Zechariah chapter 14, Zechariah chapter 14, what verse are we going to? Verse 5, notice what the Bible says. It says, and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto us all. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all, his, all the saints with thee. Twice the Bible identifies this great earthquake in the days of King Uzziah. Now when you do some historical research, you come to the words of a very famous historian by the name of Flavius Josephus. Anybody ever heard of Josephus before? Very famous Bible historian. Now Josephus records the events of this earthquake. And I'm going to read them to you. This is uh, taken from the uh, works of Josephus, uh, Josephus rather, Flavius Josephus, the Antiquity of the Jews. This is book 9, uh, page 246. Now listen to what it says. I won't read the whole paragraph, just some key parts. While Uzziah was in this state, making preparations for fortuity or for the future, he was corrupted in his mind by pride and became insolent. I'll jump down. Accordingly, when a remarkable day was come and a general festival was to be celebrated, he put on the holy garment and went into the temple to offer incense to God upon the golden altar, which he was prohibited to do by Azariah the high priest, who had fourscore priests with him, and who told him that it was not lawful for him to offer sacrifice, and that none beside the posterity of Aaron were permitted to do so. And when they cried out that he must go out of the temple and not transgress against God, he was wroth against them and threatened to kill them unless they would hold their peace. In the meantime, a great earthquake shook the ground and a, a rent was made in the temple and the bright rays of the sun shone through it and fell upon the king's face insomuch that the leprosy seized upon him immediately. So history tells us that while Uzziah was adorned in the garments of the priests, while he was going to uh, burn incense upon the altar and offer sacrifice, which was the work of the, of the priests. The Bible says when, when they tried to thrust him out of the temple and he resists, even to the point where he was ready to kill 81 men, the Bible says there was an earthquake. It caused the temple to split at the top. The sun's rays shone right through that crack, fell right upon the forehead of King Uzziah, and immediately he was marked in his forehead with leprosy. Very interesting. You see, there's, a, there's actually another story in the Bible 
that's very, uh, very similar to this story. It's the story of King Jeroboam. You remember King Jeroboam, he also was to take upon himself the role of the priest. He also was to burn incense. The Bible tells us in the book of Kings that he sets up the lowest of the people to be the priesthood. The Bible says that he puts a, 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 a golden calf in Dan and he puts another golden calf in Bethel. And the people were to go and worship this golden calf as the God that brought them out of Egypt. And then the Bible says he sets up his own day of worship. You know, it was the eighth month and the 15th day of the month. Now, it's very interesting if you do, you know, God does things by seven. So uh, uh, you had one through seven Sabbath, right? Another seven brings you to the 14th day Sabbath. So then what would the 15th day be? So he sets up that day as the day of worship. He puts a golden calf, which is an image of the beast, in Dan and in Bethel. And he tells the people to worship this image of the beast. And Dan, the word Dan means judge, civil power. Bethel means house of God, church power. These things weren't just done arbitrarily. They weren't done without thought. I'm going to set up one image in the church, one image in the state. You're going to worship this image. You're going to worship on this day that I've created. And you're going to follow this apostate priesthood. The Bible says that he set up this altar and he's doing the work at the altar and then this man of God comes and curses the altar. Jeroboam says, seize him. And as he reaches his hand out, what happens to his hand? It withers with leprosy. So King Uzziah goes in with the garments of the priest to do the work of the priest, bringing church and state together. He gets leprosy where? In his forehead. Jeroboam puts on the garments of the priest he goes in to do the work of the priest. He sets up a day on Sunday to worship. He sets up the image in the church and in the state. He sets up the false priesthood. And he receives a mark where? In his hand. What does this story, what does this remind us of? This is Revelation 13. This is where Bible prophecy draws from. This is where Revelation 13 is from. The stories of Jeroboam, the stories of Uzziah. And so we know that this sun mark in his forehead typifies the great mark of the beast, which is sun worship. And this was Uzziah's experience. Are you with me this morning? And so the Bible says, go back there with me now. Go back with me. Let's go back to, let's go back to, uh, uh, let's go back to 2 Chronicles. Let's go back to 2 Chronicles, chapter 26. 2 Chronicles, chapter 26. And let's jump into verse 21. So we want to see what happens. What, what is the outcome of this experience? If Bible prophecy borrows from this, then it must borrow some of the other principles from this story. So let's keep reading. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 26, we're looking in verse 21. When you're there with me, amen. The Bible says, And Uzziah the king was a what? A leper unto the day of his death, and dwelt in a several house, meaning he was separated. It was a uh, several house is like being put in isolation. He dwelt in a several house being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, reign, uh, 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 was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Sad way to end this story. Starts off by saying he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Starts off by saying he made the people of God to prosper. He was following the prophet. He was, he was doing all the things that the people of God should do. He was making exploits against the, the sun worshippers. He was fighting against the heathen. And then at the end of time, pride seized his experience and he becomes just like the ones he fought against. The Bible says that he brought the church and state together. The Bible says he received the mark of leprosy, a symbol of sin in the Bible. He receives this mark in his forehead just like Jeroboam received his mark in the hand. 
And how did he end his story? In repentance. When he received the mark, was he able to undo it? The Bible says he was a leper to the day of his death and he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And in Bible prophecy, those of us who are studying prophecy, we know first comes the image of the beast, then comes the mark of the beast, then the people of God are separated into two classes, righteous and wicked. And this is from the story of Uzziah. What is taking place in the days of Isaiah? You know, Isaiah began his ministry in the days of King Uzziah. Go back with me to Isaiah. Now that we have this background, now that we have this background, uh, Isaiah 6 takes on a whole new picture. So notice, notice Isaiah chapter 6. Notice Isaiah chapter 6. We'll jump back into verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1, it, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train filled the temple. So again, remembering the story and experience and events of the, of the life of King Uzziah. Image, mark, separation, those three points. And we can, we can bring out other subtleties there, but just those three is enough for this morning. First the image was created, then the mark is represented, then there's a separation between righteous and wicked, the people of God. In the year King Uzziah dies, Isaiah sees a vision. The Bible says he sees the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filling the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one having six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, with twain he does fly. And one cries unto another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, when? When does he say it? Then, after this experience, after King Uzziah dies and all those events, after he sees the great vision of the Lord where God's glory fills the whole earth and then smoke fills the temple, then he says, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It's very interesting in the, story, in the experience of Isaiah. If, if you start, you know, this is just, what, six chapters in. So if you go through the first five chapters of Isaiah, you know, Isaiah starts off very raw with the people of God. The ass knows his owner. And, you know, the ox knows his owner. The ass his master's crib. But Israel doesn't know. My people don't consider. He talks about from the top of the head to the sole of the feet. There's wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that have not been bound up or mollified with ointment. Describing that from the leadership to the lowest person, they're all as leprous men. This is Isaiah rebuking the people. You go into Isaiah chapter 3 and he's, he's laying out all these woes upon the wicked. Isaiah chapter 5, woes upon the wicked. But now he sees a vision and what does he say? Woe is me. I'm undone. Woe is me. I, I, I was called to give a, a, a word to the people and I'm just like them. I'm no different than the people I've been sent to rebuke. Woe is me. Do you think he had this experience in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5? Not at all. Isaiah felt he was better off than he really was. And we'll show you this in the spirit of prophecy. Isaiah represents Laodicea to the T. Kings, I mean, the prophet Isaiah. We're going to read. I have the quotes. And so here is a Laodicean rebuking Laodicea until Isab shows him himself. And what, did the, what was the Isab? How did it come? Well, 
you know, let's do it this way. Now, whether you know this or not, we're putting like four sermons in one, right? When the Bible shows Isaiah's calling out, woe is me. Through the scripture, those who call woes upon themselves are represented as the wicked. Job says so. In the book of uh, uh, Revelation 18, remember uh, uh, the great city Babylon? When Babylon receives her plagues and she's falling, it doesn't say woe there. It uses a different word in the Greek that's translated alas. Alas, alas, the great city. But when you look, it means woe. And so the woes of the Old Testament are the alasses of the new. And Babylon has woes pronounced upon it. But here's Isaiah calling woes upon himself. Having the experience of a people that have fallen away and an experience of Babylon that he later rebukes. Isaiah says, woe is me. Then he says, not just woe is me, but he says, I am un what? Done. I am undone. Now, you know, we can just keep it in the English uh, and, go, and, and go places with that word. It's very interesting. When something is undone, you know, let's just think of a, let's say, you know, ladies, uh, my daughters, for an example, they're, they're sick today. They're not here, but uh, they were preparing for my grandson's birthday. And they were making him some little, some little uh, 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 muffins, right? Some little, we call it chunky monkey muffins. And they were really good. Now, if you don't cook those things thoroughly, what do you call them? Undone. And something that's undone, is it fully baked? So it's half baked. Something that's undone is half baked. Something that's half baked is not all the way hot and it's not all the way cold, it's what? Lukewarm. So woe is me. I am undone. I am lukewarm. But that word undone is very interesting in the original language. It means I am brought to silence. It means I have nothing to say. I can't plead my cause. That reminds me of a certain man that Jesus talked about that when the king came in to see his guests, he finds a man there that has not on the wedding garment. And the question was, friends, how did you get in here not having on the wedding garment? And the man had a, a list of things he said, right? No, the Bible says he was speechless. He was undone. I am undone. Woe is me, I am undone. And then he says, I am a man of what type of lips? Unclean lips. And I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. I'm just like them. For five chapters, Lord, I thought I was better than them. But now I'm just like them. Now, what does it mean to have unclean lips? If you... If you if you go to Isaiah chapter 6, if you look in Isaiah 6, you don't have to go very far. Uh, there's many different places in the Bible that you can see this, uh, this principle, this point here. But if you look in chapter 6, and uh, let's jump down to, look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. The Bible says, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 7, uh, one of these angels that fly, they take the live coal from off the altar. It says in verse 7, he laid it upon my what? Mouth and said, lo, this has touched thy what? Lips. In the Bible, and it's not a hard thing to sell, it's not a hard thing to see, uh, it doesn't take great Bible study to see this, but the lips symbolize the mouth. So he says, listen, here's the coal, boom, it's touched your lips, I've laid it upon your mouth, right? Lips and mouth go together, does that make sense? And you can see this all through the scripture, so we don't need a great deal of Bible study to show this. So when Isaiah says, I am a man of unclean lips, this means I'm a man of an unclean what? Mouth. Now with that point in your mind, go with me to the book of Luke chapter 6. 
Luke chapter 6. We're talking about what Isaiah is saying about himself. Look at Luke chapter 6. We're going to Luke chapter 6. We'll just jump into verse 45. Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Luke 6, verse 45. When you're there with me, amen. The Bible says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the what? Heart his mouth speaketh. So when the Bible is talking about a man has an unclean mouth, or an evil mouth, the problem is not so much here. Where is the problem? It's the heart. I have unclean lips. I have an unclean mouth, which means I have an unclean heart. I am a man of unclean lips. Let me just give you, let's look at one other Bible text. Go to, uh, go to Matthew 15. Matthew chapter 15. Look at the Matthew, the 15th chapter. Matthew 15, we're going to verse 18. Matthew 15, we're looking in the 18th verse. The Bible says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the where? Heart. And they defile the man. We, we touched on this when we were talking about uh, that very thing. That was the title of the sermon, uh, that which defiles the man, or they that defile the man. It comes from the heart. Woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the piece, midst of a people of unclean lips. I'm undone. All these denunciations that Isaiah lobbed at others. He's now placing upon himself. He recognizes his true condition. Now, it's very interesting. I'm going to read about this. You know, when I was going through this study, I was like, man, wait a minute. This can't be. This is Isaiah the prophet. Certainly this can't be. Isaiah, which we, we call the gospel prophet. The one that Christ quotes from probably the most of all the prophets. The one who says, you know, lo, a virgin shall be with child. That Isaiah. Th this is his experience. I read in the spirit of prophecy, listen to what it says. I'm going to read two statements. Both are from Review and Herald. The first is from Review and Herald, June 4th, 1889. Listen to what it says. Isaiah had a wonderful view of God's glory. He saw the manifestation of God's power, and after beholding his majesty, a message came to him to go and to do a certain work. He felt, whole, he felt wholly unworthy for the work. Holy with a W. Fully unworthy for the work. What made him esteem himself unworthy? Did he think himself unworthy before he had the view of God's glory? No. No. He imagined himself in a righteous state before God. But when the glory of the Lord of hosts was revealed to him, when he beheld the inexpressible majesty of God, he said, I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto him having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon his mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. This is the work that as, an indivi that as individuals we need to have done for us. We want the living coal from off the altar placed upon our lips. We want to hear the word spoken, thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin purged. So Isaiah felt he was better off before he has this vision. He feels he's ready. He feels he's worthy. And then he has this great experience of Isaiah 6. Then comes the woe is me. Now notice what she says in Review and Herald, December 22nd, 1896. 
December 22nd, 1896. I'm going to read paragraphs two and 12, uh, 3 and 12. It says, Isaiah had denounced the sins of others, but now he sees himself exposed to the same condemnation he had pronounced upon them. He had been satisfied with a cold, lifeless ceremony in his worship of God. He had not known this until the vision was given him of the Lord. How little now appeared his wisdom and talents as he looked upon the sacredness and majesty of the sanctuary. How unworthy he was, how unfitted for sacred service. His view of himself might be expressed in the language of the Apostle Paul. O wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the body of this death? The vision given to Isaiah represents the condition of God's people in the last days. They are privileged to see by faith the work that is going forward in the heavenly sanctuary. And the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. As they look by faith into the holy of holies and see the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, they perceive that they are a people of unclean lips, a people whose lips have often spoken vanity and whose talents have not been sanctified and employed by the glory of God. Well may they despair as they contrast their own weakness and the glory of God and the unworthiness with the purity and loveliness of the glorious character of Christ. But if they, like Isaiah, will receive the impression the Lord designs shall be made upon the heart, if they will humble their souls before God, there is hope for them. The bow of promise is above the throne. The work done for Isaiah will be performed in them. God will respond to the petitions coming from the contrite heart. Isaiah, his experience represents the people at the end of time. The people at the end of time, Bible calls them Laodicea. Laodicea is content with a cold, lifeless, ceremonial religion. That's what she says was Isaiah's experience. And then, what fitted him for service was he saw a vision of the Lord. And that vision of the Lord was coupled with the experience of Uzziah. Remember, in the days of Uzziah, the image of the beast was formed. The mark of the beast was exemplified. The separation of classes takes place. Then he sees the glory of the Lord fill the entire earth, Revelation 18. Then he sees probation close. Why do I say that? Well, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that smoke filled the temple of the Lord. What does that mean? I want you to go with me in your Bible. Go with me to the book of, of Exodus. Go with me to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 40. Exodus what chapter? Chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40. Isaiah saw this vision. He had an experience. It enabled the coal from the altar to be able to be placed upon his lips to purify his whole being. But not until he saw himself in light of Bible prophecy did he realize who he really was. The Bible says in the book of Exodus chapter 40, look with me in verse 34, Isaiah, oh, excuse me, Exodus 40 verse 34 this is when the sanctuary was erected, the tabernacle of God. The Bible says in verse 34, Then a what covered the tent? Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now this is much of what we read about with Isaiah. Tabernacle of God is there. God's glory fills the temple. The temple becomes filled with smoke. The first time this happens is here in the book of Exodus chapter 40. Moses couldn't go into the sanctuary because the glory of God had filled it. Are you with me? Now, who is Moses? Moses is a type of Christ. Do you remember when Moses says in the book of uh, uh, Deuteronomy 18. 
In the book of Deuteronomy 18, he's preaching and he says, you know, the Lord is going to raise up a prophet like unto me. And then in the book of Acts, the, the, the apostles understood that the one risen up like Moses was Jesus. So Moses was a type of Christ. Who brought the people of Israel out of Egypt? Moses. Who's going to bring God's people out of Babylon? Christ. Right? I'm talking not just in the form of messages because he, he likens himself to the angel messages in Revelation 10. But also he's going to physically come and bring his people out. Moses is a type of Christ. When Moses could not enter into the temple, it's describing a time where Christ is not going to be able to enter into the temple. Well, when is this? In the Bible, in the book of, uh, 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 go with me to uh, 1 Kings. Go with me to 1 Kings. Let's look at a few more texts as we draw to a close. 1 Kings. Go to chapter 8. 1 Kings, what chapter are we going to? Chapter 8. 1 Kings, chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 10 and 11. 1 Kings, chapter 8, verse 10 and verse 11. When you're there with me, amen. The Bible says, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. Remember, the first time was with Moses. He couldn't go in because the, 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 the smoke of the temple of the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now we're reading a second time, 1 Kings 8. It says, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to do what? Minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. This is Solomon's temple now. Moses' temple or, or sanctuary. Solomon's temple, when they was erected, God's glory fills it. Ministry cannot take place in it while the glory of God fills the temple. Are you with me? There is another time where this takes place. First in the days of Moses, then in the temple of Solomon, and then finally in the heavenly temple. In the book of Revelation chapter 15, go there with me, Revelation 15. Revelation 15, this is what Isaiah has a vision of. Notice Revelation 15. Revelation, the 15th chapter. Let's just jump into verse 8. Revelation chapter 15, and we're looking at verse 8. The Bible says, and the temple was filled with what? Smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now, the Bible says no man is able to enter therein. Well, question, what man was there in the first place? Jesus. He bore our humanity to heaven. He's still the Son of Man, even though he be there. The Bible says that because the glory of God, the smoke of the Lord, fills the temple at the time of the seven last plagues, Christ cannot enter in, meaning his ministry there is done. Now, when does Christ's ministry end? What do we call that? The close of probation when Michael stands up. When he ceases his ministry. When the plagues begin to fall, this is when the glory of God or the smoke of the Lord fills the sanctuary. So what does Isaiah see? He sees the image of the beast and this order. We're not, we're not convoluting the order. This is the order of the Bible. He sees the image of the beast, church and state coming together. Which Sister White says is our great test. Why is it our great test? Because, friends, once the image of the beast forms, the mark of the beast is next. And when the mark of the beast is next, the separation of classes takes place. And when the separation of classes takes place, then there is the glory of God filling the whole earth and then finally filling the temple and probation closes and the plagues pour out. When we begin to see church and state coming together, we are living in the days of King Uzziah. 
Now, if we are not seeing this taking place today, if we don't realize we're living in the time where church and state is coming together, if we don't realize that everything that is being done judicious, judicially, everything that's being done behind the scenes and overtly is bringing church and state together, how does the prophet of God say it? She says that the signs of the, uh, uh, of the times that are thickening upon every hand are not sufficient to arouse our sleeping energies. Then darkness proportionate to the light that we have had will overtake our soul. Brethren, we are living in the time. And so Isaiah's experience must be our experience. In the day that King Uzziah dies, we have to see the Lord. We must have the experience. We need, as the prophet said, a coal from off the altar touching our lips. And the Lord saying, your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. We must have that experience. And the way we have the experience is the same way Isaiah had it. How does Isaiah have it? Well... In his experience, he understood the days of Uzziah. He was before John the Revelator. John the Revelator hadn't penned his book yet. But he saw all the events of Uzziah's life. He knew that story. He was prophet at the time that Uzziah committed his great apostasy. Then he sees this experience of Christ filling the temple, or the, or the glory of the Lord rather, filling the temple. And when he recognized that at that moment, he wasn't ready. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I, I, woe is me. The experience of the vision of Bible prophecy that has been written for us in the book is what he saw that caused him to see himself as he really was. And when he saw himself as he really was, because the eye salve of God's prophetic word cleared away the scales of self-sufficiency, then he was able to see clearly, and there was a work that he was able to do. Then he becomes the gospel prophet. Then he's able to take Christ to the world. Then he's able to say, when, when the Lord says, who shall I send? He's able to say, here I am in me because I'm ready now you see far too often like Isaiah we go to do a work that we're unready for we think we're better off than the people we're serving and instead of recognizing our own condition and just putting woes upon the people there's a greater woe upon us because we have so much light and yet that light has not penetrated the scales of self-sufficiency in our eyes. But if we see the vision, if we take time to look at the Word of God as Isaiah looked, then we too will have the experience. Daniel had it. Daniel chapter 10. You read about Daniel 10 where the Bible says that he, he, he understood the vision, he saw the vision and understood it. But when he sees this great vision of Christ, his comeliness is turned into corruption, and he retains no strength. And Sister White writes and says that that's the very experience that we have to have so that we can give the trumpet a certain sound. Every representative man in the Bible, all the prophets that have this experience, it was the vision of prophecy that clarified their vision to see Christ clearly. And then they saw themselves, and then they had a work to do. God has an experience that he wants all of us to have. And that experience that prepares us to do the work is the sure word of prophecy. There is a reason why we are a prophetic movement. There is a reason why Bible prophecy has been the, the, the bedrock of our movement from the beginning. It's not so we can just point out who the little horn is and who makes up spiritual Babylon. It's not for that. It's so that we can see ourselves as we really are. Then we can say, send me. 
works in me. In the book of Ezekiel, I want to close here. Go with me to Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. The latter part of Uzziah's experience, or I should say Uzziah's experience and Isaiah's experience, when you look at them both together, not only does it show the, the outline of events in Bible prophecy, you know, first the image of the beast, then the mark of the beast, separation of classes, and glory of God filling the earth, and then finally the glory of the Lord filling the temple, and probation closes, and not just all of that, but the experience of these two men illustrate the, the principles of the Ezekiel 18. And I want to look at this with you, because it's interesting. Uzziah was good, righteous. Started off great and then messed up in the end. Isaiah says to it about himself that, hey, I was undone. I was, a woe was me, right? I'm unclean. Isaiah has that experience and then flips it in the end. And is that righteous man of God who is able to do a work. Notice what it says in Ezekiel 18 as we close. Because friends, this is going to be us. We're either going to be Uzziah or we're going to be Isaiah. There's only two classes of people. It's Uzziah or Isaiah. Choose one and choose wisely. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel 18, let's pick it up in verse 21. Ezekiel 18, when you're there, amen. Ezekiel 18, 21. The Bible says, but if the wicked will return from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions that he has committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all in the wicked that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God? And not that he should return from his ways and live, but when the right just turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he has done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he has trespassed and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Yet ye say the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal or not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness and that he hath committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because he is, con because he is considered and turned away from all his transgressions that he has committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal, are not your ways unequal? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to, of his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit, for why will ye die, O house of of Israel. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live. In Ezekiel 18, you have two classes of people. One is represented as committing great sin, yet he considers and turns. And God says, all that life of sin, all that lukewarmness, all that cold formality, all that experience will no longer be mentioned. Amen. But then there's the Uzziahs among us. Who, sometime in our life, we, we, we turn from our righteousness and commit iniquity. And God says, you can't come with a list of all your good doings and say, but Lord, for... 40 years I've been in the church. I just played a little bit and fell. God says all your righteousness will not be mentioned. But if you play in sin and die in sin like Uzziah died in his sin, it didn't matter that he started off by saying, the Bible started off by saying he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. 
didn't matter then. All the exploits, all the goodness, all the prosperity that he brought to Israel didn't matter a straw then. We're either Uzziah or we're Isaiah. We either recognize ourselves and consider and turn to God or we get caught up in the end. And then it doesn't matter you were in present truth. Then it doesn't matter you have the charts. Then it doesn't matter how many books you pass out. Doesn't matter then. Isaiah or Uzziah. Either way, we're going to say, woe is me. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name we come before you today. We ask, dear God, that you would help us to have the experience of Isaiah. Now, before probation's door closes, now while Christ is ministering in the heavenly sanctuary, may we, like Isaiah, see a vision. Yea, the very vision of prophecy that has been listed out for us and delineated well. May we understand that we are living in these times where these events are taking place before us. May it be enough to arouse us from our lethargy. May it be enough to arouse our sleeping energies. May it be enough to cause us to consider our ways lest we be lost. Let none of us, Father, have the experience of Uzziah that actually fulfilled prophecy and received the mark in his forehead. I ask, dear Lord, that we be ones that change. So that when the call, and even now the call is being made, you are looking for a people to go forth. You are looking for a people to fill the world with your glory. You are looking for a people to be those angels that fly in the midst of heaven with a loud voice. You're looking for that people. Let us be able to raise our hands with confidence and say, here am I, send me. Bless us, Lord, and keep us. May that be our experience. In Jesus' name, amen.